And I never would have learned it back then. When the student is ready, the teacher will appear. I wasn't ready to learn it. Picture a campfire with a group of your friends sitting around it and everybody has a story to tell. Now, let's bring your friends inside, leave the campfire outside, and listen to their stories. The ninth thing that you guys should know about me is I don't believe in coincidence. I believe things happen for a reason and they happen when they should happen. I believe that Wayne wanted to have one last glass of wine with his sister and thank her for all of the great stuff she had done. Hello. Nice. <laughs> well, welcome to the Teletark Gallery. How many people have uh, not been to West Side Stories yet? Is this your first time? Wow. Yay. No. <laughs> you and a friend. No. You're first. <laughs> Just kidding. So, um, my name is Linda Postreader. I'm one of the owners here. And I am uh, the We love having this event. And uh, I get to talk a little bit about what we got going on here in the gallery. The show that you see around you is a, a very special show for us. It's the first time we've done it. It's an Art Trails preview show. Art Trails is one of the oldest open studios event in the nation. And it's been going on for close to 30 years and is uh, just really, really a great time to go out and see the artists in their studios. And um, they do a preview show every year and we offer to do it. And, Petaluma is not often seen as, a, as an art destination, but I want you to repeat after me. Petaluma is an art destination. Ready? Petaluma is an art destination. Yay! All right. And, um, and this is helping get us on the map. Uh, we're really thrilled that we've got so many great artists showing with us. 47 of the artists are from Art Trails, and then we've got some of our master artists also. So do enjoy that. Coming up, we've got some things going on. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, the third Thursday of the month, we have the Smart Women Business Networking, and uh, Tracy Mason, who is the Sales and Marketing VP of Clos de Bois, will be here with some wine uh, to talk about women in the wine industry, which is uh, should be a lot of fun. That starts at 5.30, um, $10 for non-members. Uh, poetry Walk this Sunday. So it starts over at the Art Center at 11, wanders around uh, downtown and all kinds of events. I've got uh, some flyers here and then ends up, I think, at Aquas. But they're here at 5 o'clock uh, for the, um, oh, <laughs> um, <laughs> the Ashbury Literary Journal. So, oh, glad I remembered that one. <laughs> anyway, um, so if you do want to do that, it's a free event and a lot of fun, a lot of great uh, poetry. Then on um, next month, uh, I don't know, this is really small. This is Chris Clark's latest CD. She re-released it uh, a couple of years ago. She sang for Motown uh, in the early days, uh, was at one point their VP of, uh, of their film arm, and she's going to be singing here at Pelican Art right after uh, Art Walk in October. So it's October 8th, and it's Chris Clark and friends just jamming with us. She's got a saxophone player, a keyboard, and another vocalist. And I hear a guest uh, performer, which I'm not quite sure who that is and, and uh, stuff, but it's going to be a really fun evening. So we'll have the, the disco ball going and some chairs sitting around, and it's really just going to be about listening to the music and having some fun. So, I appreciate you letting me tell you all about that, but we're here tonight for West Side Stories and uh, very uh, coming up almost on our one year anniversary, but uh, our mastermind behind it, help me welcome Dave Picorni. Thank you, folks. Oh my goodness, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, hi. Let's try that again. Uh, hey, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, hi. Hi. So much better. 
Uh, welcome back for those of you that have been here before, and uh, welcome for the very first time for those of you who have not. By applause, how many people have been here before? Let's do that. By applause. Yeah. There you go. All right. Uh, you got in there. Uh, those of you who have, who have been here uh, know the, the spiel, but I'm going to give it to those who have not. These are five-minute true stories told live on stage without notes. That's what we do here, and uh, it turns out to be quite a lot of fun. Uh, you will learn a little bit about one of your neighbors here tonight. Uh, the, the theme tonight, you do a theme every time, the theme tonight is easy money. So uh, if you have a story about easy money uh, or some variation thereof, uh, feel free. Uh, we still have a spot or two left if you wanted to sign up. That's all good. Uh, I will pull out random uh, names and uh, people will come up. They will be your actual names. They won't be random and then I assign your names, but uh, they are actual names of people that signed up and uh, they will. They don't know when they're coming up on stage. So that's why we handed out the little tiny uh, uh, thin piece of paper and asked you to give us a little sentence about uh, Easy Money because in between storytellers that kind of gives the next storyteller a little time to uh, think about, oh my god, I'm, I've been called. You don't have to just jump out of your chair. I will uh, call the name and then uh, you get a couple of minutes to settle your stomach a little bit. So there you go. A uh, little bit about me. Made my living as a stand-up comic. Uh, worked all over the country, blah, blah, blah. Uh, had kids, chose not to go on the road anymore. And so uh, I, we settled here in lovely Petaluma. Saw a show like this in New York and thought, why not Petaluma? And uh, we are coming up, like she said, on a one-year anniversary. Uh, next month actually is our 12th month. So uh, I know, it's kind of cool, actually. And next month, on uh, October 12th, see, it is uh, Halloween coming up. We're going with the theme of I'm so scared next month. So you have a month to get ready. We are here the second Wednesday of every single month. And uh, it's only five hundred dollars to get in. So uh, I'd like to thank a couple sponsors right now. Uh, one is uh, Petaluma Community Access Television, and that is who is filming right there. Uh, Zach, who has been filming us for a month, or not a month, a year, every month. So thanks, Zach, for coming on down and editing yeah. and putting it on Petaluma Community Access, which, by the way, if you don't know, we are nominated for one of their first uh, awards, and they're the Luminary Awards, and uh, there are a bunch of different categories, so go on the PCA website and uh, vote early, vote often. In fact, uh, it's the old Chicago way. It doesn't matter. You can vote as many times as you want. In fact, if somebody wants to vote now while you have a smartphone, I'm okay with that. <laughs> During me, all right? When any of the other storytellers are up here, do not do that to them. But uh, I, I will take questions, Amanda. Uh, Is there a special category you put on and I gave Yeah, I actually, uh, as, as many as a million times that I've voted already, uh, I'll tell you where I'm voting. I'm voting under Best Promotion because we do promote Petaluma here. Uh, I'm also voting under Best Series because we are a series. We are on uh, twice a week. Uh, on uh, community access, and I am also voting as best show because it is just quite frankly the best show. So there you go. And you know why? Because it's you guys. It has very little to do with me. You guys come up here, you tell the stories, you guys are the ones that make it the best show. So go on there and vote for yourself. Come on. Uh, and then, uh, not only are they one of our sponsors, uh, Pelican Art Gallery. How about a big round of applause for putting us up here? And the uh, Pellet Bar Foundation, uh, they are uh, a big part of us as well. And then uh, lastly, we do have a third sponsor now, which is kind of cool. Uh, the person who uh, made all these little bookmarks, which tell you, and you can grab those either over there, uh, Juliet has some, or they're on the, the table over here. These bookmarks tell you the themes for the rest of the year, and these are printed out by Electric Crayon Printing up in Santa Rosa. So uh, thank you to them as well. They did a very nice job, and uh, they have all the themes on there, and the dates, and the time, and all of that good stuff. Uh, so there you go. Uh, wow, let's see. Easy money. I, I thought long and hard about easy money, and uh, a lot of times there is no easy money. But uh, I, I did think about, I was a stay-at-home dad for seven years of my life, and every time on the playground that I, you know, another dad would happen to be there, and, and he would say, what do you do? And I would tell him, I'm a stay-at-home dad, oh, I would love to not work. <laughs> that, that was the phrase that I heard. I had no idea how hard it actually was 
to not work. It is the hardest thing ever. And, and I did it for seven years. I thought I was going to get so much done in that seven years. I had absolutely nothing done for myself. Uh, in fact, I was running from morning till night doing everything. I mean, and when I say stay on that, I mean, I, I did everything that uh, your, you know, June Cleaver would have done uh, back in the day, except without the pearls and the heels. Uh, well, without the pearls, but that's, you know, <laughs> you know there. Um, but I, I, uh, I did, you know, the cooking, the cleaning, the shoveling kids from this place to that place. And, and uh, I love, I, some of the best years of my life. Uh, did I homeschool? Absolutely not. I am not insane. But uh, I, did, I did think I, that I did teach the kids a few things here and there. I'm kind of hands-on teacher, actually. Uh, things, for example, like you want to know your left from your right, well, you just look at your hands. And that one has an L right there. There's your left right there. There you go. See? You're all learning stuff right now, aren't you? Yeah. How about uh, you want to know the uh, amount of days in a month? People a lot of times get confused. Again, use your hands, the knuckles. If there's a knuckle, it's 31 days. In between is not. January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September. There you go. Yeah, learning hands on. I also, you know, taught by experience, too, uh, a lot of times. I remember one time I was actually putting together one of those little Casio keyboards for my daughters, and uh, I was laying under, underneath, and I put the, the plate on the top there, and then I reached down to grab the screwdriver, and bang, the thing hit me in the side of the head. I said, hey, girls, gravity, that's gravity right there. That's, that's caution, it's gravity. Uh, and then uh, another one was uh, after one of their birthday parties, I was out taking down the crepe paper and stuff, and I went to, uh, out on the back uh, deck there, and I went to go step on a chair to get uh, the, the crepe paper there. And it was that moment where you step right in the chair, and I, I realized as my weight was shifting forward that I didn't step far enough onto the chair, so the back of it started coming up, and it was the point of no return, all right? You're already going this way, the back of the chair is coming this way, and it's that hard outdoor plastic chair that just bang right into the face and I lay on the ground and blood is pouring out and I thought right there this is a teaching moment is what this is right here. So hey girls this is why we don't stand on the furniture right here. This is I like being a stand up dad it was great. Um, you know there, there was a lot I mean so, some people think you know <coughs> that it's completely you know, you're not working, but you're on the clock 24-7 is what you are, I swear. You know, in the middle of the night, kid has a bad dream, choo -choo, punch right in, you are back on the clock. Uh, the, uh, you know, it's so funny because they, they, you're getting ready to do dinner, you're barbecuing, you got the coals and a perfect white hot and the steak has been marinating all day, you're just getting ready to put it on and you hear this thud coming from the inside of the house, and you go running in to find your four-year-old on her knees in the, the room with blood coming down, and just, you know, she's obviously taking a nosedive off the top bunk, and uh, she's doing that cry, you know, that silent cry, that one where they're sucking in the air, and they're <laughs> sucking, and, and, and it, you know at some point they're going to be full, and it's going to blow, and it's going to be sustained, and really loud, and she can punch right back in. <laughs> And then uh, there's those days when they're both in school, and I'm going to sit down, and I'm going to maybe fold a little laundry. Speaking, speaking of that, I don't know if you guys know this or not, men mostly, uh, did you know that the laundry is not actually done until it's folded and put away? <laughs> That's a rule. I didn't actually know, so there you go. Just get it out of the dryer, and you're good. Uh, so anyway, you're going to fold a little laundry. You made a nice little hot pastrami sandwich on rye with a... Swiss cheese just melting over the edges of the bread. You get a little pickle, some chips, maybe a cream soda. You're going to watch a Giants game, middle of the day. You're going to click on the phone rings. It's the school. Head lice. <sighs> choo -choo, punch back in. There you go. Yeah, I used to, you know, I stopped watching a lot, a lot of uh, sports. I watched, I used to watch constantly. Because mo most men, the only time they can multitask is when they're watching sports. Somebody will come in and say, what's the score? 101.99, Bulls, two minutes left. 14 nothing. second quarter, Patriots. 0-0, just about to kick off, Dallas Green Bay. 68-60, uh, Supersonics, boom, that's it. Now that, that's multitasking for most men right there. That's, pretty, that's a pretty good skill right there, keeping track of four games on one TV, that's not bad. That skill went away after a little while of being a stay-at-home dad, and I developed other skills and uh, things like um, 
you know, get ready to go pick up the kids. I can actually start a load of laundry, go pick up the girls, come home, put the clothes in the dryer, start a load of dishes. Take the girls, one, Alexis to gymnastics, drop Miranda off at softball, go do grocery shopping, pick up Alexis, pick up Miranda, get them both home, set them up for homework in the kitchen because I can bring in the groceries while they're doing their homework, always checking on the homework, putting away the groceries, except for the groceries you need for dinner, starting to make dinner, getting the roast in the oven while helping with the homework. First one gets done with the homework, argue about getting her into the shower, help the other one finish up her homework, get the roast out, get the other one out of the shower, argue with them about that's how they don't want to eat that for dinner, quickly whip up some macaroni and cheese, throw that out on the table, get them in bed, and then go sit in front of the TV clipping coupons, watching the highlights of the four games that I used to watch all the time. Yeah. That was easy money right there. <laughs> That's going to do it for me for right now, but I'm going to be back and forth all night long. Right now, I am going to pull a name out of our hat right here. Well, it's not really a hat. It's a wicker basket for those of you scoring at home. Let's see. I'm just going to go with this one in the middle here. Let's see who we have. Who's our first storyteller for tonight? Ray Engen. There you are, Ray. There you go. You're first every time you sign up. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but uh, there you go. Uh, there, um, while he is preparing, right here, um, in a sentence, tell us about easy money. I once had an old VW that had an electrical, uh, an electrical fire. Since it was a 1959 VW, I got top dollar and was able to purchase a newer car, easy money. <laughs> and then this one right here, in a sentence, tell us about easy money, ain't no such thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. That's all there is to it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our stage Mr. Ray Engen. Keep it going for Dave McCorney, ladies and gentlemen. I remember the first lesson I ever learned in life. I was a little guy, toe headed. We're in Oshkosh de Gosh, matching the randoms. I was teetering atop a stool that I had placed on top of a chair so I could forage through the adult cabinets trying to find the forbidden treats. And it was that day that I realized that everything small wrapped in foil was candy. <laughs> Until I found the bouillon cubes. <laughs> That was the first lesson. Every other lesson I think I pretty much learned from my father. And he's the one that really got me started down the easy money pathway. And he's the one that dismissed the myth of easy money to me. Because he's the one that showed me the closet is over there and I put my coats in there after I drink. And I found Then I found paper money. And then I found more. And then my dad found out. <laughs> and he told me, what did you do with my money? I bought baseball cards. <laughs> you idiot. But the gum is fantastic. You're a moron. And that was my father. He was a very interesting man. He saw things a little bit differently than you or I do. For example, I joined Toastmasters. And my father told me when I joined Toastmasters, he said, do you realize that Toastmasters, this is a fabulous invitation my father, by the way. <laughs> you have no idea how good this is. <laughs> do you realize that Toastmasters is the only organization that when they call you to the front of the room to accept an award, nobody yells out, SPEECH! <laughs> My father was a child of the Depression, which means that he was thrifty, and he understands the value of a dollar. 
All right, my dad's cheap, okay? Here's what he did to save gas. He would drive 12 miles to save 10 cents a gallon in a car that got eight miles to the gallon and then only put six bucks in. Now, I know this sounds like some kind of SAT question, right? But when I pointed this out to my dad, he just told me that that was his way of teaching me that not the, that the cheapest price was not the best value and that lessons you learn in life are better learned when you learn them yourself. Now, not all of his lessons that he tried to teach me got through. There was one Christmas I asked him for Hot Wheels racing cars. He gave me a turtle. He told me that I had to be able to handle something slow before he gave me anything fast. And I loved that turtle. But it was defective. It had blisters on its feet two weeks after I got it. So my dad took it back and he exchanged it and he brought another turtle home. One week later, the new turtle had the same blisters on its feet that the old one did. So my dad loaded me, the turtle, into the car, off to the pet store we went. My dad came out guns blazing to this guy. He goes, you sold us defective turtles. I can't believe you're giving us sick turtles. Blah, 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 blah. Then in the middle of the argument, they both stopped and looked over to little old me on the floor while I was playing with the turtle. Vroom, 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 vroom. I think I taught my dad something that day. Turtles do get blisters. <laughs> now my dad, he would try and compliment, but he would do that to suck you in. It's kind of like, It'd be kind of like if he brought, walked you up to an open guillotine and told him there was something really cool on the other side. So just check that out, what's on over there. For example, he would come up and he said, you know, I stuck up for you today. Really? Yeah, your mother said your room wasn't fit for a pig to live in, and I said it was. Oh. <laughs> That's what he did. <laughs> <sighs> thing go after this. <laughs> my, dad, uh, my dad hated it when I was sitting around at home lying on the couch. And one time he walked home and he looked down at me and I was sitting on the couch and he kind of scowled became his honest face and he looked down at me and he frowned and he said, you know, it was summer after senior year in high school and he looked down at me and he said, you know when Abraham Lincoln was your age, he was studying to be a lawyer. I looked my dad right in the eye and I said, Dad, you know when Abraham Lincoln was your age? He was president of the United States. <laughs> now, if my dad died recently, I know what you're thinking, what a great way to bring a humorous speech to a halt, but we paid five bucks to get in here. That's a hell of a lot cheaper than grief therapy. <laughs> if my dad was cheap, he'd be proud right now. But basically, Dad, this is for you. Um, I get it now. You were my father, not my friend. And I think I'm better for it. And God, I hope you're up there. Because <laughs> I wound up just like you. Either way, Dad, thanks for the ride. <laughs> and to tell you one more thing, that baseball card collection I got, I sold for $40,000, down payment on the house. That's easy money. <laughs> Thank you. going to be John Tornes. All right, John, that will be you. Okay. <laughs> John's family is here this evening, which is really nice. Um, all right, uh, a couple little things before we bring John up. Uh, this Friday and next Friday, 
Uh, I am doing my one-man show. I have a one-man show, and it is called Based on a True Story. And there, uh, subtly, I brought the flyer for me. Right there. Uh, and uh, I will leave it over there so to remind you guys that uh, I'm at the Glazer Center the next couple of Friday nights. Uh, he's in Santa Rosa. I'll give you direction. I'll give you a ride for crying out loud. What the hell? I have a van. We'll get a bunch of you in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, if you get the opportunity, you have uh, nothing else to do on the next couple of Friday nights, come both times. It'll be better the second time, so there you go. Uh, and, uh, in a sentence, tell us about easy money. Well, pretty simply, winning the lotto. No, no, you have some sort of teaching credential, don't you? That's not really a full sentence, is it? So there you go. Uh, uh, full sentences is what we asked for, everyone. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that would be fairly easy money right there. Uh, and then in a sentence, tell us about easy money. My father was a compulsive gambler. He gambled on everything into his 80s looking for easy money. That's it. I don't know if you got it. I have no idea. Uh, but he was looking for easy money. Ladies and gentlemen, he is right there in the on deck circle. Please welcome John Tornes. There he is. I'm going to re reiterate. There is no such thing as easy money. <laughs> when I was growing up, I too had depression uh, parents, and um, I'm sure that many of you out there have experienced similar acts such as um, boiling broccoli stalks or adding water to ketchup bottles to get the last <laughs> drip of ketchup out. Unless you grew up with depression, you really don't understand where these people are coming from. So. There were the childhood stories that went along with that as to why we put water in the ketchup bottle. <laughs> and those stories evolved around Uncle Tony. Uncle Tony was vivacious, outgoing. My cousin Rick says he was the first closeted gay person in our family. He was also a bachelor. He was very successful at being outgoing and was a shoe salesman. He made a lot of money as a shoe salesman. My grandfather, his brother, was a hardworking farmer. Uh, unfortunately, in the Depression, uh, being a hardworking farmer was not the profession that you would want to pick. So, Uncle Tony came to the rescue. He saved the family farm when the banks came to take it. Uh, so, Uncle Tony is enshrined in this little shrine we have in our family collective memory as to who saved the family farm. A couple lessons I took from that growing up. Uh, one, don't choose a profession that's going to bankrupt you. <laughs> Two, don't piss off your siblings. You never know when they're going to have to come to your rescue. <laughs> and three, stay single as long as possible. <laughs> you will need the money. So going off on that tangent, I decided as a young adolescent I'd go out and get my first job and make a lot of money. I started delivering papers for the Columbus, Ohio Citizen Journal, waking up at 4.30 every morning to load up my little red dragon and ban the papers. And a profession that's sadly no longer available to kids. I don't know if you've noticed, but there are no more paper boys, no more paper girls. It's all gone. So all that great training as a little businessman, uh, taking on responsibility and um, delivering your papers every morning is no longer. It was a great experience. I was, it was not easy money. It was uh, early, and in, I don't know if you've ever been in the Midwest in January or February, but it's not where you want to be at 5 o'clock in the morning walking in sub-zero temperatures putting papers in people's doors in the exact way that they want it or else you get yelled at. <laughs> Funny thing is that when you went to do the other part of the job, which was collections, those same very people that were persnickety about how their paper was to be put inside the screen door vertically were never around when you knocked on the door. They gave you some sort of excuse as to why you had to come back and when you came back, if you got them, they wouldn't be there. And this is a great lesson for a young person as to how human nature wraps around money and, and uh, a lot of training that I think uh, a lot of kids could benefit from. So from that, I ended up uh, buying my first stocks as a paper boy and, and uh, ended up paying for my 
college education that way. So learned something as a young man, went into a profession that picked up on that and uh, continued as a financial planner. And now the, the study in human psychology continues. It's uh, fascinating. Um, no matter how many times you tell people to buy low, sell high, <laughs> whenever the market plummets, people call you and say, the market's at its very bottom, I want to sell everything now. Or, back in the 90s, the dot-com boom, look at these dot-com stocks, they can only go up, there's a new paradigm. Let's buy as much as possible. So this is where you try to talk conscience in these people. I had one client uh, in San Francisco in the 90s who worked for a dot com, got stock options with her dot com, and put all her retirement money in her 401k in the dot com stock of the company because it was going up like a rocket. And there is only one way to go, and that's down. Down. <laughs> Depends on who you're talking to. But uh, she ended up not listening and drinking the Kool-Aid and drinking more of it along with her colleagues. It's amazing how when lots of people are doing something, it's much easier for you to convince yourself that that's the thing to do. So she lost her job. Lost her stock options, lost the 401k. And it's a sad story that happens again and again. Sometimes people get through. My wife had a similar story in her family. Uh, it turned out to be happy this time. Her aunt uh, worked for many years for PGE, not to be confused with Pacific Gas and Electric. This is Portland Gas and Electric up in Oregon. And uh, she had a lot of stock in her retirement plan through the company. Um, retired, and uh, her husband retired, and he was driving her nuts. So she decided she needed to do something, get him a hobby, keep him out of her hair, and uh, cashed in all her PGE stock options and built him a, uh, an auto shop so he can go out there and work on cars. Within a few months, PGE was bought out by this Texas-based energy conglomerate that was run by some of the smartest guys in the room named Enron. And all her friends who had PG in stock, who worked hard for that company and saw it through the ins and outs and had all their retirement in PG stock, saw all their retirement funds go nowhere fast. So, very, very scary story. Reiterated Bank America and many other sad episodes. So, where does that leave me today? Um, my wife and I have run off to West Marin, where we live on a farm, exactly where my great-grandfather was in the Depression. So sometimes, you really don't learn a damn thing. <laughs> Uh, believe for those of you who have not been here before, I forgot to uh, tell you a little something. A little green ticket that you got at the uh, beginning when you walked in here tonight, very valuable for someone in this room because after we uh, hear all of the stories this evening, I will call all the storytellers back up on stage and they will all sit here and I will pull one of these tickets out and uh, that person who holds that ticket will get to choose what they thought were the was their favorite story of the evening, and that storyteller will win $50 tonight. So that is a very valuable ticket. So those of you who did not realize what the green ticket was, that's what it is right there. So there we go. Uh, now I am going to ask Zach, pick a number between one and six. I know your name's not in here, so three. One, two, three, there it is. Our next storyteller tonight is going to be Luke Stoddard. Luke, right here. Yes, there you are. Hi, right, Luke. Uh, right here, we have, um, in a sentence, tell us about Easy Money. I was in Vegas taking advantage of a cheap steak breakfast. 
and a guy heard I was trying to get to Albuquerque. He said he'd pay me $200 to drive to Albuquerque. I decided to wait for a flight. Probably a good idea. <laughs> uh, and then this one here, after several weeks of partying, taking our guests' beer cans and recycling them, easy money. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> or so. There you go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Luke Stoddard. Welcome. Hey, cheers. I wasn't planning on doing this when I walked in, but the wine is fantastic. <laughs> so I'm a little nervous right now, so if you could do me a favor, let me say one, two, three. If you can all, not too loud to make me more nervous, but if you could just say, relax, it would be a personal gift to myself. So, one. Two, three. Yes. Yes. I feel better already. Thank you very much. Um, so, I can tell you a story about easy money, and of course, um, as all good stories, it's a story about love as well. Um, <laughs> so, the year was 1991, 1992. Uh, I was a eager young man in the wild city of Provo, Utah. And, uh, big party spot on the West Coast through the Western United States. Um, and I was in junior high school. Uh, Fairer Junior High School, which was shaped like a huge castle, so, you know, maybe insignificant, but it was a big deal for junior high school in, in Provo. And it was my first year in junior high school, which is obviously a huge, you know, huge thing for a young kid, the wild, wild world of junior high school. And so it was much larger than my elementary school, and I was no longer the largest kid there. I mean, I was pretty close, but I mean, it was not the, the largest, which is kind of an alpha thing I like, so. Um, so the great thing about, about this class is we all sort these new classes. We had this business class, which was taught by this very young, you know, impressionable, recent college graduate who had all these great new ideas. He was bright-eyed, had like the dead eyes like most teachers have nowadays. He was bright-eyed and very enthusiastic about how he was going to change our, you know, 12-year-old minds about business, so. Uh, he instituted this commerce into this class. We had this money. It was fake money, but he promised that at the end of the year there'd be a huge party where there'd be such treasures as Cheeto bags, large ones, bags of Twizzlers and huge two-liter bottles of such Provo treats such as Sprite, and root beer, and other non-caffeinated items. Um, which was a big deal for us, because obviously we could study and we would get something for it. So it was like a little mini commission for doing good work. And also the other benefit of this class was that there was this beautiful girl in this class. She was, you know, ninth grade way beyond my league, of course, seventh grader. Um, her name was Jenna Bythro, and we her to this day. She wore very classy clothes, a lot of guests, a lot of British knights. <laughs> she had some uh, this, this shirt, um, which turned colors when you pressed your hand on it, which was a big deal. A lot of guys like to, you know, help her show how awesome it was. <laughs> she didn't let me, of course, drive. I asked, but she said no. But, um, that was a weird time. Um, so, anyway, I got very excited because the teacher said, you know, you do these assignments, if you do them well, you'll get dollars. You'll get these fake dollars, which we're going to use in the class. I mean, the whole driving spirit behind the class to teach you the importance of money and how each of these assignments is worth money. And he said, and to start it off, at the beginning of every class, if you come into class with a quote, a memorable quote, I'll give you five bucks right off the top, first thing in the class. In the first couple days, no one, no one brought a quote. He's like, no one has a quote, it's free money. <laughs> so I said, I got a great idea. So I went home, and we had this huge book at home called like Quotable Quotes or something like that. <laughs> so I started writing down every single quote in that, and I cut out about a hundred strips of them. And I sold them in the beginning of class <laughs> for three dollars. And I said, this is easy profit. I'm going to give you this. You didn't have to do anything. Raise your hand. If he picks you, you make $2 profit. You didn't do anything. And I'll sell one to every one of you. So no matter who he picks, you're going to, you're going to win. And you'll have one for next time. People thought it was a great idea. Because they got once for doing their assignments. So people, I, I was making money hand over fist. I had tons of money in the class. I was loaded all the time. And um, because, we had, you know, throughout the semester, and because of that, I kind of got a little lax in my schoolwork. And I just figured, you know, I've got the spirit of this thing. It's making money. I'm making tons of money. Big money. Big grades. Maybe, maybe not so true as I thought. Um, and so what happened as the, as the year progressed, 
we got closer and closer to the big party. The coveted bags of Cheetos and Twizzlers. Two liter bottles of caffeine-free Barks root beer, <laughs> which they only sell in Utah and Idaho. And, uh, and so the, the, the day came. The other great thing about this class was there was a large teacher's assistant. I remember him because he was very big and he was very acne-laden and he was very morally flexible, which I immediately admired. I liked him quite a bit for that. And, uh, but the best part about him was that he was very corpulent. He was quite a stout person. And I knew that he really liked things like Cheetos, Twizzlers, two-liter bottles of caffeine-free barks. So the day before the party, I approached him and I said, you know, I have about, I can't remember what it was like, 10,000 fake dollars. The entire spread can't be worth more than about 6,000. So I'll tell you what I'll do. I will give you $6,000 if you take my C and turn it into an A. And he said, that is a fantastic idea. And I said, I also think that is a fantastic idea. So we had this immediate bond, commonality, agreement, immediate. So um, after class was over, our bright eyed teacher was like, yes, oh my gosh, I'm the best teacher ever. Damn the rules, I can change it all. And he left, and we went over, and he popped open the computer system, and he bumped my, well, actually, here's what happened. This is kind of the embarrassing part. Um, <laughs> he opened the computer system. I'll finish quickly. And I saw my grade. I saw everyone's grade, the whole class. There was a C to an A. He's like, 6,000, no problem. And, and then I saw Jenna Bythrow's grade. And her grade was a D. <laughs> Then I made a choice that only a fool would make. <laughs> only a fool would make. I said, Phil, or whatever his name was, my corpulent friend, of course I didn't say that because I was afraid of him. Um, I said, tell you what, I will give you this money if you change her grade to an A. And he agreed. And he called me an idiot. He's like, have you seen her guest jeans? You'll never get near her. She's in ninth grade. I can't go near her. I'm not allowed to. You'll be the vice principal. And I said, I know, but maybe this is just what it needs. She will admire me for this. And the next day, we cleaned up. The day after that, it was the day right before the end of class, the grades came out. She was ecstatic. And the teacher, I guess, they actually pay attention to who are the good students in class went, that doesn't seem right. Why does she have a good grade? She's done nothing but chew bubble gum like guys touch her shirt. So he grabbed, and why does my TA have all the money in this class? And why did the other fat kid not buy any food? He's like, there's a lot of things here which aren't working out in the world of business as they should work out. So he was a smart guy, just a little naive. So after a quick interrogation of the TA, he sold me down the river. I didn't realize his moral flexibility went both ways. Um, I was thrown out of the class and given an F. And he was fired as the teacher's assistant. And since the grades had already come out, I'm pretty sure she kept her A. So, Jenna Bythrow, wherever you are, you are welcome. Hopefully you still have your British Knights, <laughs> and your guests, and your Jerbos, a little tag in front. And, uh, and so, so, so the story is, it seemed like easy money at the time, selling quotes with fake money to other 12-year-olds, but I guess it wasn't so easy with my F, I had to bring home mom. was nervous. There you go. How about that, folks? It's not that hard. It's like a big campfire. There you go. Yeah, everybody. There you go. I guess he's told that story before, though. Yeah. Well, Nicely yeah. done. There you go. Uh, we're going to go with a uh, number between one and five now. Since I know Luke's name is already out of there, pick one, Luke. Uh, four. Four. That would be one from the end, so I'm just going to go that. There we go. Uh, that is... Matt McGuire will be our next hey. storyteller right there. In the meantime, uh, in a sense, tell us about Easy Money. Uh, 30 years ago, scouting whitewater rafting locations in Northern California for a TV series, $100 a day plus expenses. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's like pretty easy money, unless of course you've heard my canoe story, which <laughs> not so much. Uh, and a sentence tells about easy money: a check in the mail for thirty thousand from my insurance company after being hit by a car on my bike without asking for a dime. Yeah, in parentheses it says the collarbone healed well and the concussion was mild. So, well worth 30 grand. There you go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Mr. Matt McGuire. There he is. Thank you, sir. Let's see, back about 1971 or 72 when I was a long-haired hippie craftsman making uh, sterling silver rings in my home in the valley, the San Geronimo Valley over in North Marin or West Marin. I uh, had finished a batch and was going down to the post office to deliver it. Unbeknownst to me, being a, you know, a young hippie, it was Columbus Day and the post office was closed, which turned out to be very fortunate. I, uh, as I walked down the winding road uh, down the valley to the uh, post office, here came this guy, about 6'4", big guy. And this is about 11 in the morning. He's smoking a joint, and I'm pretty tall and liberal, you know. Okay, it's a little early, you know. And it's it's like, you know, hey, hi, what's up? And say, like, oh man, I'm looking for my last puppy, man. I really, you know, the people here are so nice. I'm just knocking on the doors and asking people, have you seen my puppy? I'm going, well, I haven't seen your puppy, and don't knock on that door because I'm not home. And so I go down to the post office and it's like, eh, didn't feel real good about this guy. The post office is closed. It's like, yeah. so I'm walking back, winding my way back up the the valley road and. And it's a very strange thing. Only a couple times in my life have I had something like this happen. I had a visual picture of the guy in my house. Just clear as bell, like a photograph. And I thought, son of a he better not be. <laughs> <laughs> and as I came, the house was, there was, um, the road wound up the canyon and there was a little dirt place to park and there was a creek and a little wooden footbridge across and the steps up to the front of the house and a, you know, porch across the front windows, you know, and, uh, you know, I was just kind of cogitating on this, and I'm walking down, I got to cross the bridge, and son of a bitch, I see that guy run through my house. I, oh, you So I was just furious. I was completely just appalled and shocked and, and incensed, and, and I happened to, you know, have a pile of, like, firewood on the side of the house. And this was some eucalyptus that I had scored, and it was like two years old, and you know eucalyptus. That stuff is like turns to iron. And there was a, I, I had a nice, you know, branch, it was about two and a half, three inches thick and about four feet long. And I could see the guy, he was running around. He, he was not gonna come out the front because he saw me. So he was going out the back. And it's like, I knew the back door was locked and you can only unlock it with a key. So he wasn't gonna be able to just, you know, spring out of there and sprint into the woods. So I zoomed around the house, grabbed this log, and, you know, it just the guy was breaking down the door and get back in there, mother, get back in there. And, 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 you, know, not, you know, he could see I was not happy. And, you know, he was big, but he saw the anger in my eyes. <laughs> and uh, so he went back in, and, you know, I'm pushing him, and, you know, and he's like, you know, so what are you doing in my house? What are you doing? Oh, man, I thought this was my friend's house. I was like, you lying, that's so big. You know, <laughs> and, you know and it's like, it, it dawned on me that he'd like, all right, so empty your pockets, pal. And so he starts emptying his pockets, and he had gone through the house, and he had collected my girlfriend's, you know, granny's antique rings, and, you know, the few nice things that we had, you know, like maybe one of my pieces of jewelry. <laughs> 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 and it's like, you SOB. And he, you know, he had a little black, um, you know, phone bug, and he's emptying it. Like, and I'm going, I'm reaching for the phone. I'm like, you know, I said, you should have thought of this before you busted in here, pal. You are busted, and I'm calling the cops. You sit down, because you are going to go to jail. I don't care. You know, I don't care what your lying excuse is. And, uh, oh, no, you don't understand. I just got out of jail. Yes, shut up, because I'm calling. So then he starts getting pretty aggressive. And, you know, I'm trying to hold this log in one hand, grabbing the phone, <laughs> trying, trying to dial, because you dial phones. And, uh, and he's grabbing the phone and pulling it away. And, and I'm thinking, you know, that I could really just lay this guy's head yeah, God, they're feeling like blood on my rug. And my girlfriend had come home and go, what happened here? And so I, I just couldn't quite bring myself to just bust the guy open. It just wasn't in my nature. So, you know, after we tussled a while and, you know, I'm screaming at him and, you know, cursing and yelling. And finally I said, well, you got one chance. I threw open the door. I said, start running. 
Because I knew from every TV show, you call 911, they'll catch them at the end of the block, right? <laughs> like I say, I was very young. What did I know? Um, so, you know, call the sheriff. Three hours later, I call him again. You know, finally, they show up, give him the description. Oh, 6'4", I was like, you know, here's a bunch of photos. Comes back, said, no, none of those. It's like, well, it sounds like, uh, here's a bunch of other photos. That's the guy. Just pegged him. Well, they caught the guy a couple days later. He's been on a riff, you know, busting into houses. He was some Marin County, you know, rich kid junkie who just thought he was privileged enough to be able to go into whatever house he wanted and take what he wanted until he got caught. So the long and the short of it was that <clears throat> some months later, there was a trial. He asked for a trial. Not a jury trial, but a judge trial. So my girlfriend and I go, and I'm a witness, and do you see the man who broke into your house? Yes, Your Honor, there he is. Oh, my girlfriend, oh, my hero. <laughs> and they, it was open and shut. They, they called him off and he was guilty. So you're thinking, this is easy money? Well, let me tell you. When all was said and done, several months after that, we got our jewelry back, which had been held as, you know, uh, evidence. And in there was his little black book. And in there was 11 pounds British money which I cashed in for $22 and got $25 worth of witness fees. That wasn't that easy money. Matt McGuire, ladies and gentlemen, Matt McGuire. I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we're nominated for this Luminary Awards that you go online and you uh, vote for. Okay, good. Uh, I have my laptop here, just in case. <laughs> All right, just check it. Uh, here we go. We are going to uh, have Matt call out the next number, and it's between one and I believe we are four. We are down to the last four right there. Matt? Let's do four. Number four. That'll be that one right there. All right, let's see who we got. This is John Tung, is who it is, right up front here. And in the meantime, I'm going to applaud you for me saying their names. That's for them, right? Not me? Because I am pronouncing everything right. <laughs> Uh, let's see here. In a sentence, tell us about easy money. When I was 10, we packed up a huge U-Haul and moved to Texas with my new stepdad. After being in Texas for about a week, the trailer with all our possessions was stolen in the middle of the night. Pretty sure my new stepdad sold the trailer to make some easy money. We were left with only the clothes on our back. It's just a plain sad ass story, is what that is right there. Jeez, why won't even bring that up? Uh, in a sentence, tell us about easy money. Crazy pay carries a not so easy price tag. Is that Shakespeare? What the hell is that? <laughs> it's a haiku. There you go. One too many syllables, sorry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our stage John Tyler Mary. How about Dave's new haircut, huh? Yeah! yeah. How about that haircut? Okay, um, there are actually several people in this room who were witnesses to this story because it happened just a couple months ago, a month and a half ago. As some of you know, I'm an artist, and that is indeed how I make my living, so I have to do other things, too. Um, I do a variety of different things. I have a contractor's license. It's an electrical contractor's license, so sometimes I pull that up and do stuff like that. Um, so I go on Craigslist very often, and I look up things that look like maybe I could do that. So I went on Craigslist, and um, there's a section that says jobs, and you go down and it says gigs, creative, I forget the other categories. Um, so I go, okay, I look under the gigs, because that's usually like a one-time thing. And I look up, and somebody over in St. Helena needs surgery on a porcupine. <laughs> okay, I made that up, but you'll understand why I said that in a second. Um, they said they wanted a electrical wizard to rewire two chandeliers. I'm like, yeah, I'm an electrical wizard. You know, I understand resistance, ampacity, etc. Okay. I can do this. So I arrange to meet the people, and I go over to this lovely wine-tasting shop over in St. Helena. 
And uh, there are the, actually, Leslie went with me. There are these two chandeliers, really using a broad use of the word chandelier. Um, they are probably, I'm going to say, five feet high, uh, maybe six feet in diameter. Each one uh, ha has 28 uh, little lamp holders, which are gone. Someone has stripped them all out. So it's a total of 56, because there's two of these things. Uh, the country of origin of these things may be somewhere in Central America, Guatemala maybe. They're made from some kind of scrap uh, tin that is exceedingly sharp. That's why I'm joking about the porcupine thing. So um, I look at these things and I'm like, well, I could probably do this. I think I can, you know, run the wire through all these little, uh, these little conduits and everything. They're all kind of welded together and kind of to get in there, you have to reach around all these sharp things. And I'm thinking, I can pull this off. This looks pretty good. And the lady is very nice and she says, well, you know, we've had some other people look at this and I just want you to know we're certainly not going to pay more than a thousand dollars for this. And I go, oh, okay. So thank you very much. I go home and I'm thinking about it and I go, no way, no way. The materials are going to be, you know, three hundred dollars. I want to make some easy money on this. So uh, I, I sent her an email and I said, um, you know, I'm really sorry. I know you said your budget was a thousand or less, but it's going to be fourteen hundred and fifty bucks to do these two rewires. I'm thinking, oh, I won't get the job because she said she wouldn't pay that much. Okay, as you can guess, uh, indeed, she called me back and said, "You got the job." <laughs> so, um, someone in this room uh, went with me to pick these things up, <laughs> and we, this individual, <clears throat> who's the First person to my left, in the first row right here, uh, is helping me load these things into my little Mazda truck. And we're wondering if even the two of them will fit in a Mazda truck. Well, there is a way, and we found that way. Uh, poor Steve got cut nicely a couple times just putting him in. Uh, I get him back, long story short. Uh, I have now healed from, uh, there was a really nice, about only about a half inch scar, but it was pretty deep, and I had these little cuts all around my hands. Um, it, it was not easy money, folks. Uh, <laughs> someone had sandblasted the things in the rain or something, so every single conduit with a little wire was packed with some kind of special abrasive sand, and I had to dig it out of these long pieces of conduit, on and on, I mean, the story could go on all night. Uh, but the, the worst part of it was the, uh, the, it's like working with a stack, a big haystack of knives. And so I, I'm trying to get all this stuff done, and, you know, thinking it's going to be easy money. Um, it indeed was not easy money. Uh, I paid in blood to do this job. Um, the materials ended up costing me about what I thought, about $300. So I did make some profit, but uh, if you broke it down to the hourly rate, um, it was not, it was not easy money. Uh, and I have to tell you that I'm the one who wrote Ain't No Such Thing on the little strip. Uh, I'm, I'm sticking with that. There ain't no such thing as easy money. Anyway, thanks. Richard. John Tom, ladies and gentlemen, one more time. Good job. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, here we go. I do what I love, and I love what I do. Every day I feel like I have won the lottery. My life could not be better. That's easy money, baby. Oh, wow. <laughs> You're the one. <laughs> All right, so here we have it. Uh, we stopped in Las Vegas for a short break on a road trip. Sitting at a bar, I found a quarter in the embedded slot machine. I play played it in the slot in front of me and won enough money to buy dinner for my companion and myself. Easy money. There you go. Right, right there. 
show will be found money. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Amanda McTeague to our stage right here. Actually, David's McTighe. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a joke on Facebook that's coming up there. Only one person ever in my life has gotten that right. I, I've never done this before, so bear with me. Uh, but I wanted to talk about easy money because when I saw that phrase, uh, my mind went back to where I'm from. I'm from partly, and I'm, my speech is going to change when I talk to you. I'm from uh, Mounts, North Carolina. I'm from a town of 100 people. I'm about 57, I was born in 54. So where I live, there was no TV, because there was no cable, there was no radio, because you're in the mountains, so you don't get no signal. It's a really, really simple place. It was really, I, I'm very fond of it now as I think about it. But in this town, there was a man who lived there, and his name was Bobby. And Bobby was simple. That's what we used to say. That's what my parents taught me to say. He was simple. And Bobby was about my age, about 57, and his, he lived with his mama, so his mom was about 70. And she would dress him every day, every single day of my childhood that I remember, in a blue, powder blue suit, perfect suit, and he would have an umbrella, and he would have his raincoat, because it always rains in the mountains. It rains every day, about 2 o'clock in the mountains, so he always had his raincoat and his umbrella, and he would walk the town. The town was about as big as is this, a real mountain. And when we were children, we would say, hey, Bobby, because we were taught, everybody was very kind to him, nobody was ever mean to him, and we would say, hey, Bobby, and see him around town. And Bobby, there were only two things that Bobby knew how to say. And one was, watch him, money. He would say, watch him, money. If he saw like a stick and he thought it was a snake, he'd say, watch him, money. And the other was, easy money. And then what that meant was, you're, you're too loud or you're running too fast. So he was watching money and easy money. That's my first thought as I see that phrase. And then let me just page you forward now. I, I did go to college and I ended up in New York thinking I wanted to be an actor. Oh my God, what was I thinking? It was so long ago. And I was basically Bobby in New York. So now I'm him. And I have an apartment this big. And I'm just scrambling to make a living, which anybody, some of you have done this. I took any job I could get because I needed to pay the rent and I needed to pay for those acting classes. And actors are very kind people, so I was at a class and this guy, this cool guy said to me, I got it, I got the coolest job for you, totally easy money. Go down to Wall Street, 11 p.m., he, he, he steered me to this glass office building, gave me an address, Go up to the third floor, see Mr. So-and-so, easy money. And on my way out, he says, I, I think, great. Of course, I'm not thinking, 11 o'clock, what am I doing? Whatever. <laughs> it was a long ago, it was in the 70s, you could sort of trust. Uh, so I do. I'm Bobby, right? So I go down in the subway, 11 p.m., Wall Street. Wall Street is a crazy place at 11 p.m. Right? It's crazy and deserted. Go up to the third floor, and the angels are with me because Mr. So-and-so is there. There's a Mr. So-and-so, and here was the gig. The gig was one night only, or I guess two nights, because he'd done it the night before, that actor. It was counting furniture in one of those giant glass office buildings, every single floor. They were inventorying the furniture, and they were paying by the piece. So I'm standing here with like four actors. I'm the only girl. And he's got these sheets of barcodes that you peel off, and you're paid by the piece. So my job, your, your job, was to take a floor and label every chair, every desk, every lamp, every, every, every. And the reason you wanted a trading floor is on a trading floor, every piece of furniture is identical. So this guy, obviously, I don't know, maybe I'm young, I'm the chick, whatever. I, he hands me a sheet, we each get a different floor. And I go up to like the 17th floor. And God, can I just tell you, a trading floor in New York, at, now it's the middle of the night. No, a trading floor in New York is kind of as big as Petaluma, these buildings. And they're basically open. They're just, they're columns and they're desks. Back then, there are no cubicles. It's just as far as you can see, it's desks, it's gray, it's 
computers, a little bit of computers back then, and that's it, and me. I mean, the elevator opens and I've got this sheet, and I look, and I got a trading floor. So I ran, I ran, the whole night I ran with these stickers, bam, 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 and end of the night, it wasn't easy money, but it was great money. I mean, like a hundred bucks an hour, which never since have I ever made such good money. So those are my two stories about easy money. Amanda Tide, ladies and gentlemen. One more time for Amanda. Amanda, a number between one and, no, not between one and two. That would be incredibly stupid. One? There's still a choice. One or, one. One or two. I'll take two. Two. Uh, they were this way, so this one. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this one right here. This is Craig Logan. Mina is here. Uh, I believe Craig is another first timer tonight, so we're gonna. Where's that? All right, cool. Um, before we bring up Craig, a couple little things to read for you, and this one right here. In a sense, tell me about easy money. No, you tell me about easy money. <laughs> In my experience, this is an oxymoron. So there. <laughs> and there, uh, secondly, in a sense, tells about easy money. Well, it seemed like easy money at the time. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Put in your own joke there. So there you go. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, how about a huge round of applause for Craig Logan? Yeah. 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 Good evening. I've been a cab driver in Marin County for almost 32 years. And one of the most common things that people say to me when I tell them how long I've been a cab driver is, oh, you should write a book. <laughs> and my response is usually, that takes a lot of work. That takes a whole bunch of work. I'm never going to get on Oprah. I'm never going to go any, any place. I'm too lazy for that. But I can come up with the title. Okay? So the title of my book came from one of my first customers in... 1979, just I started Halloween Day, 1979. Within the first week, one of the most famous customers in Marin County cab driving history got into my cab. And he said, don't you know who I am? And I had heard about him already. This is somebody who legally changed his name to God. <laughs> Enrique Salve, also known as Ricky Silverberg. He used to say, I'm half Portuguese, half Italian, and half Jewish. No country or ethnicity can contain me. He was paranoid, schizophrenic, with delusions of grandeur. And he actually went through the trouble of legally changing his name to God at the Civic Center of Marin County. And he's the one who, who spouted what would become the name of my book, uh, if I ever write it. Um, <laughs> he found out when he went to the Civic Center that you have to have a first initial and a second initial before your surname of God. And so he chose U and B, which stood for ubiquitous, bountiful God, in that order. Otherwise, he would be called Bug. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, what he used to do is run accounts with drivers he used to get crazy pay because Social Security was kind enough to get paranoid schizophrenics with delusions of grandeur, $750 a month in 1979. So, that's easy money, one would think. So, <laughs> he would order from the night drivers. We used to deliver booze and whatever else a lot somebody wanted as long as they had cash. Um, he'd get a bottle of Smirnoff, two packs of Ding Dongs, some Twinkies, and a box of matches. <laughs> so by the 20th of the month, Ricky, also known as Enrique, also known as God, would run out of money. And he would be staying at the Pimitor Palms, he'd get kicked out, and some drivers would kindly front him the money until he got his next crazy paycheck on the first. And, <laughs> oh God, Ricky. <laughs> He still remember his face. He, uh, 
would get in a fight with somebody. He would get institutionalized. He'd get thrown in jail. He would, he would ride up at the crisis center. And all these drivers would be stiff for about 10 to 15 days, sometimes two to three months, sometimes longer than that. However, when Ricky, also known as God, got out of these institutions, he would call up the cab company and there would be several hundred dollars out in, in accounts. <laughs> and he would say to the dispatcher, I want you to tell all the drivers that God is back in town and he's got cash. <laughs> and so he would start the whole cycle again. This would go on for years and years and years. And finally about, that was 1979, 1980, I'd say about 1988, I looked in the back of, I looked in the rearview mirror and I saw his face. And we were doing a grocery run in a halfway house in Carolyn. <laughs> and I recognized him right away. I said, I said, God, where have you been? <laughs> and he looked me straight in the eye and he said, oh, I'm not God anymore. It's not so easy. Thank you. Okay, before we uh, pull our last one, and Craig, I'll ask you to pick, pick one. Uh, zero. <laughs> All right, we got it. Uh, nicely done. Uh, before we uh, call up that next story talk, you know what? You guys are a nice crowd. Love having you here. I would love to have twice as many of you next month. Uh, on the 12th, we have a show right here. Again, the theme is I'm so scared. So uh, tell your friends. Uh, you can sign up on an email list. We do have a Facebook page. Uh, anything we can do to get people in here that doesn't cost me any of my easy money. Okay? So. Uh, tell people, tell them to come on down. It's a whole five dollars to get in here, folks. So uh, you have at least gotten seven dollars worth of entertainment tonight. So I think we've really stretched the limits. And there's one more story to tell us. Possibly as much as eight, nine dollars worth of entertainment. There you go. Uh, also, you know, our shows are now on YouTube, and you can see them anytime you want to click on West Side Stories on YouTube. Uh, tell your friends about it, but only if they're going to come and see them live. Okay, because uh, much better to see stories live and in person, true stories. So tell them to come on down. That's the 12th of uh, October, right here, 7 o'clock to sign up, 7.30 showtime. So our final storyteller for this evening is Bradford Rex. And before we bring Brad up, uh, a couple of little, oh yeah, you got to applaud because I said it correctly. There you go. Uh, 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 on our very first horse race, the Belmont Stakes, and our first time out after our babies were born, we won what was called the Daily Double and won $300. Wow, that is easy money, unless, of course, you're a horse. Uh, in a sentence, when I was three or so, uh, my granddad used to give me a whole dollar to spend on candy at 7-Eleven per week. To me, it was a windfall of riches. <laughs> A dollar at 7-Eleven? Yeah. You can't even get in for a buck. <laughs> Jeez. All right, ladies and gentlemen, our final storyteller tonight, uh, one of my favorites. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Bradford Rex. Here he is. I wish I had a dollar at 7-Eleven. Uh, 1973, I found myself at the King of Prussia Plaza also known as the Mall at Philadelphia. I was there with Ricky Bodge and Jimmy Delicardo, and Michael Hales, and uh, I think Tommy Spaws was there, I'm pretty sure. And uh, I had a pocket full of money. We weren't there to go shopping. We were there to look at the flora and fauna. Um, we were terrified of women, but we were fascinated by them. And at the age of 13 years old, I just, um, I just wanted to follow girls around at the mall. And I was too young to be 
uh, arrested for a stalker. Uh, <laughs> but there we were to follow girls around and look and, and just see them in their natural state and just try to see what they, were, what they were up to and what they were doing. And I had a pocket full of money because my father, knowing that I did not possess an entrepreneurial spirit, he had, um, he had forced me to buy a lawnmower and I mowed everybody's lawn in the neighborhood and most people paid me very well. I made five dollars a lawn and I've been looking at this painting, thinking about Mrs. Dreeby. Mrs. Dreeby was my guidance counselor, and she was about 104 years old. And she was not a pleasure to look at, and she would stand in the backyard on the patio in her bathrobe, which was... This isn't funny. And it was rarely belted properly. And she would smoke cigarette after cigarette and drink whatever uh, whatever wine you could get in Pennsylvania at the time while I mowed the grass and she would pay me extra and my father would make sure that I wrote everything down on a ledger um, you know how much time I spent how much I was paid uh, how much I paid for gas and what I was paid for someone and I was always uncertain what to do with the extra money that I got from Mrs. Dreeby because she paid very handsomely but she also had quite a, quite a number of books at her house that she was happy to lend out to all of us in the neighborhood. And who was I to tell my parents that Mrs. Street didn't dress properly while I mowed her grass? <laughs> there I was at the mall with a, with a pocket full, maybe two pocket fulls of $5 bills because I just collected from everybody that I mowed grass from. And this fellow in a skirt with finger symbols asked me if I liked the Beatles when I was 13 years old. I said, of course I do. Who's not to like the Beatles? I'm 13 years old. I love the Beatles. And he wanted to sell me a book about them. And I reached into my pocket and out in my sticky fingers, my sweaty pant, hands, because I was looking at other 13-year-old girls that I was terrified to ask to a movie or a dance. And um, two $5 bills were stuck to my fingers, and he grabbed the money, and he handed me a book. It had nothing to do with the Beatles. He did say something about George Harrison um, going and studying with the Dalai Lama, and I had no idea what he was telling me about, but I had this worthless book in my hands. And Ricky Bodge, Jimmy and Delicardo, Michael Hales, and Tommy Spaws asked me what I had, and I told them I just bought a book from a hippie, and Tommy Spaws was really was really steamed about the whole thing and took off and said, dirty hippie, and we didn't see him for three days, and Lord knows what happened to him. <laughs> but I had to go home and in my ledger write, ripped off by Harry Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> to almost the close of our show. What I'm going to do uh, very shortly is I'm going to ask all of the storytellers to come back up here. And then what I'd like you guys to do, everyone sitting out there who has a, a green ticket, think about which one was your favorite story of the evening. Because when I call that number, you are going to just immediately say who it was. You're not going to wait. You're not going to think about it. You're not going to see who's paying you. None of that stuff. <laughs> what you're going to do is you're just going to call out that one right there, and that is the storyteller that you choose. But before we do, once again, I want to thank Pelican Art Gallery. Thank you guys very much. Okay. Uh, Zach, first of all, and PCA for coming out and filming. And hopefully, you know, giving us dinner when we win this award. Uh, again, that's the PCA website. You go on there and vote. Uh, and, of course, uh, our printing company, Electric Crayon, for helping us out with all the uh, materials. Peace. Uh, I'll hand for those guys as well, right there. Yeah. Grab one of these on the way out. It'll tell you the rest of the uh, themes for the rest of the year. Uh, he has just picked up my poster, which I am going to, again, uh, about the haircut, uh, just so you guys know, it's cheaper to get your haircut than it is to get new pictures. So I had to look like my headshots. So that was the deal right there. <laughs> And, uh, of course, sign up on our mailing list, uh, get the lovely e-blast I send out to remind you about the shows. And at that point right now, if I could have all of the storytellers come right up front one more time. If I do pull a number uh, that is one of the storytellers, you can't pick your own. 
Ahora sí. Hey, one more time. Let me big round of applause. This is a very, very good evening. A couple of new combos, actually four. Very nicely done. This is the ticket I am picking right here. It is six four six four six nine six. It's you. You can't pick yourself. All right, I'll pick it anyway. I'm going to pick someone. Uh, yeah, that's. Well, you got it. <laughs> Get it out of there. Let's try another one. We won't give them a ticket next time. For crying out loud. Why waste the ticket on you storytellers, for God's sake? 646 4701. There he is right there. Pick one of these guys. What gals? Hey! See you then. Thanks once again to everybody who came out. Tell your friends. Sign up for Facebook. Good night, everybody. California.